Hotep, and welcome to Matters of Diversity with Dr. B. What a phenomenal opening that was, huh? All right, we got a new opening. Thank you, Azan. Appreciate that. That looks really, really nice. So today we have as our guest, Dr. Amber Norman, who is a licensed mental health counselor here in the state of Florida. She's a visiting professor here at UCF. With her clinical practice, she supports the health and wellness of ethnic and sexual minorities. And so without any further ado, I would love, 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 love to have Dr. Amber Norman show up, show up in this space right now. Dr. Norman, how are you? Hi there. I'm well. Good, good, <laughs> good. for good, having good. me. Well, I'm glad that you could be here. Um, it's a very special day today that we're having this episode about. And um, I've had numerous conversations with you in the past about things that have been going on, how you have been dealing with the situation at hand when it comes to posts. And so I'm really happy to have you as a guest today. And so, uh, so thank you, looking regal and beautiful today. Um, how are you? <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty well, um, no complaints on, on my end, but uh, this is a really great topic to talk about. And I'm glad that I was invited to really participate in this discourse, so. Well, you were the first person that came to mind for me. Um, um, this has been a series of firsts with this podcast. And so I always want to make sure that those who have the right voice are on for the right moment. And um, I could not think of a, a better person to have on than, than you. So um, I met you some time ago um, when you were journeying through your master's program in counseling. And now you have your doctorate. So, and that was very, very recent. You're about a year in at this point. So how, 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 how has things been for you now that you are on the other side of the education side of the house? Yeah, it's, it's been a very interesting journey. Uh, that's for sure. Um, I think that um, graduate work is just really hard, but what I love about it is that it's so meaningful. You sort of get to um, choose a path that you feel like is very um, customized to your interests and it's really there to help you kind of make your mark on the world. Um, and so I feel like I've been able to do that with the myriad of different experiences I've had um, in my master's program and in my doctoral program and doctoral study. Um, and so now I feel like I'm in a place where um, I get to now sort of carve out my own space um, within academia, within um, sort of the pedagogical frameworks or even within the counseling practice as a whole. And that feels very empowering, right? So I feel like yeah. I've done the work and I've learned a lot. And now I'm in a place where I really get to make all of that learning um, matter and come to fruition. Nice, beautiful. So tell me a little bit about um, your life post the post tragedy. We, we, we've had conversations uh, a lot about that and things that you, you, know, you experienced on that day. We'll get to that. But how has life been for you post? And it's, it's going on its fifth year uh, in terms of our anniversary. Yeah, definitely. So, um, you know, as you said, we can sort of jump into the experience of that day a little bit later. But um, what I will say overall is Pulse changed everything um, in terms of um, my um, sort of position um, as a um, as a as a queer person, but then also just even as a resident of Orlando, Florida, right? So that tragedy definitely shifted a lot of things um, for us. Just being in this space and having to witness such a tragedy, right? right, right. Um, and then I think that just for me as a human, I just have really evolved and um, become very introspective about not just my individual identity, but what that means within a larger system, right? So what does that mean around um, how I feel about myself, how I feel about my safety and how I feel informed community. And those are things that I think the post tragedy sort of thrust at us, right? It sort of forced us to be having certain conversations or to really grapple with the reality of what's going on. 
And then really in the last five years, it's been about healing. It's been about restoration. It's been about asking questions and developing new narratives. And I think I'm still on that journey. Okay. Um, and it's really taken all of those five years to even get to, um, you know, the place that I'm in right now. Um, but it, it's, it's definitely just been different. And I think that that's just what happens with trauma. You're different because of it. Yeah. Um, and, and definitely, I think I've been on sort of a, a healing um, and restorative journey ever since then. Yeah, because I don't think that we could have had this show five years ago. You and I, we couldn't have this conversation. This was not, oh, absolutely not. This was not no. the space that you were in. This is why I wanted to start here. I wanted to talk right. about what was going on with you and your history of this whole situation and how you were able to get to the healing process. And then to hear you even say today that you're still not quite healed, just goes on to show you how trauma really impacts individuals and each person differently. But oh, 100%. You, yeah, this is actually um, just full disclosure. This is the first time that I have spoken on a public platform um, about the Pulse tragedy and in terms of its impact on me directly since it happened. Um, I did do um, sort of a talk almost like in the weeks right after. And you're right, I was different. I was raw. The emotion was really raw. We were still all just confused and trying to figure out what does all this mean? Um, and that's really what that dialogue was about. Right. Um, but I have not um, chosen to really um, unpack and really reflect on that experience um, until now. You know that word unpack? <laughs> I tell you this every single time. You were the first person who ever introduced me to that word. I was like, I'm going to unpack this with my client. I'm like, you're going to do what? What, what are you doing? Y'all not going anywhere together. What's going on? Why are you unpacking this stuff? And it's can, such a great metaphor, though. It's such yeah. a great metaphor for processing and, and just sort of examining the complexities of, um, of any situation. Yeah. So let's go back five years now, if we can. And um, tell me a little bit about what was um, what that day meant to you when you heard it? Because I remember, you know, and maybe I'll tell a little bit of this story. I think you were out maybe that day and you weren't necessarily at Pulse, but you were out and you got home and you were asleep. And maybe somebody called you. Is that what the, and somebody said, do you know what's going on? And you're like, wait, what, what's going on type of a thing? Is that kind of how this whole thing kind of played out? Yeah, so I was about a mile up the road um, from Pulse on the evening of the shooting. Um, I was hosting uh, an event for, um, for writers um, and creative writing and, and things like that. And we sort of adjourned somewhere around 10, 30, 11 o'clock, something like that. And I do recall that there were people um, at the writing event that were talking about, oh, hey, let's go to Pulse after um, just to sort of hang out and you know take a load off and things like that. Um, I was super tired. I decided I did not want to um, join that group that was going out and I ended up going, um, going home. But I did receive um, a text message from one of my really good friends um, telling me, hey, there's a shooting at Pulse. And this was at two something. And so I was, you know, just very, um, you know, a bit in shock. Um, my second thought, however, was to text the individuals that I knew were planning on going to Pulse, like in that were in my friend circle, just mm -hmm. to verify that they were safe. And I did, they confirmed that no, we ended up changing our mind and we didn't go. So they were at home and things like that. Um, after that, then um, I just received a lot of frantic text messages. Um, it was one of those situations where, you know, you can't Google anything. There's no news because it's literally happening in that moment. Right. Um, and, and from what we know about how the, um, the, the, the pulse shooting sort of unfolded, this was like an hours long process standoff, all these other things that went on until, you know, the early, yeah. early hours of the morning. Yeah. And so it was a very uncomfortable and unsettling sort of waiting game that you just didn't know what was going on. Yeah. And, um, and it's just, it, it was just very, um, it was just very scary. 
Um, and then of course, as the day went on and you have news outlets that are giving more details and sort of describing more of the scene, you really came to understand how horrific it was. Um, and that, you know, I think that, you know, sort of opening fire in any space is unsettling. And I think that sometimes you think, oh, it's not gonna be that bad. Maybe a couple people got hurt. And then when you hear that there's 49 bodies on the ground, you're like, whoa, this is next level. Um, and then that's when fear set in. So I think I went from shock to um, sort of a, 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 a rescuing, like I needed to know where my friends were, right? So that's went from shock to sort of desperation. Then you went to horror, then you went to fear. So yeah. I think all of those um, feelings were very present um, at the onset of the tragedy. And so you have a private practice. Mm -hmm. And during that time, you actually went into like um, a kind of a different type of a mode, if I remember correctly. You kind of started doing a lot of work around that. I mean, you were actually doing some work on site, I believe. Um, right. So it was very much, I think, um, a, a call to action sort of happened almost immediately, um, particularly like from the community. Right. So even though there was a lot of discouragement from the city at the time around organizing, we needed a place <laughs> to organize. We needed a place to gather and to sort of feel each other and just kind of be in that sort of grief. And so um, that very large demonstration that happened down by the Dr. Phillips um, arts uh, place, I'm not entirely sure what that's called, um, but that was really a very grassroots sort of response that eventually the city of Orlando was like, all right, they're gonna do it anyway, just let's make sure that we have some support out there. But that was a response to, we have this collective grief that we have to put someplace, we need to feel each other and things like that. In addition to that, it's like then from a professional level is now I have to also respond to this grief in a way that is less personal and right. more professional, right? right. So right. I, I ended up sort of juggling, um, you know, some compartmentalizing a lot of my feelings, right? So yes, I had my personal um, experiences that were going on, um, but then I think what overrode some of that was this um, need to be there for my people. Right. Um, and so that looked like um, responding to some of the organizing that was going on within the mental health community. So Lindsay Kincaid was really the spearhead of that in terms of organizing what we like to call the infamous spreadsheet. Yeah, that I ended up having hundreds and hundreds of counselors that signed up um, to do some trauma counseling, on site counseling, um, and then also um, offering pro bono. Um, opportunities for families and other members of the community. So I definitely raised my hand as someone that was ready and willing to serve. Um, and that's what I did. Um, I think that it, it, you know, it, I had to push myself aside a bit in order to show up um, in that way. And that was really heavy. It, it really was. I think I did really good work during that time, but it definitely was a bit of a drain um, on my system, because we're dealing, we were just holding space for just a massive amount of grief. So how were you taking care of yourself during that time? Do you remember? Um, so I know that we are really the, the cheerleaders for, for self care. But admittedly, during that time, I wasn't taking care of myself, right? Um, right. I, I really, I, I just I wasn't, it took me about two. It, and then it led me to about two or three weeks after, um, it was like 4th of July weekend. And then that is when I retreated, right? So I literally went camping with my friends for four days. So I mean, I literally retreated from all of the noise and the angst and things like that. But I also didn't feel like I was able to do that until I was able to deal with the acuteness of the trauma um, as it was presenting itself. So I still did not take a break until I felt like, okay, the clients I'm working with have maybe gotten a little bit stabilized. So now I can take a break. I can take a step back. Yeah. Um, again, that was also, I think, just a reflection of just, um, just not having the best boundaries 
right? I think that if I knew what I knew now, then I might've approached that a little bit differently. My boundaries are a little bit better. Um, and so maybe I would have been a little more balanced in my approach with Pulse, but I admittedly threw my entire mind, body, and soul into right. that trauma effort. And in that, you were helping others, but weren't doing things to help yourself. I was not. I was not. And that's why when I went out into the woods with my friends, it was so regenerative because um, I was able to kind of get some quiet, kind of focus a little bit more on my inner experience, um, which I think I was better for. Because when I came back after taking those days off, I think I was able to show up and respond to my clients um, in a, in a, in a, in a healthy way. and helpful way. Yeah. And so snaps to um, Lindsay because she really did kick it into gear. Oh, yeah, she did that. She did that. Know, I mean, you can't speak for her, but did she, did she also kind of, you think, experience what you were going through, not taking care of herself and, mm -hmm. and going into that kind of a mode? Oh, yeah. Lindsay, Lindsay and I are we, Lindsay and I are, are very good friends. I mean, we I just saw her a week ago, mm -hmm. and we still talk about that. And she uh, she's in the same boat where she was not taking care of herself during that time, and uh, and she still considers herself as being in recovery from that sort of collective trauma that we all right. had to endure. So I, I think you know, for a lot of counselors, that experience was probably you know, a, a wake up call when it came to, um, you know, self care and, and grief and sort of managing our own stuff and what that really looks like, what burnout feels like, um, because we were really taking on a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm gonna ask you a really, you don't have to answer this question, but know. is there forgiveness? For what? Not to yourself, but even to the shooter. Is there forgiveness? What what is a what is that process, right? In terms of because a lot of people are saying in order to get past something, you might have to kind of like look at the situation and say, well, this person was tormented, this is this and that. And I'm not trying to give this person any props, but I'm saying though that in your healing process, is there forgiveness? Or is that something that's always going to be left? untaken care of so the way i see it is that the ideology that fueled this violence is not dead so it has not been resolved right this is we're talking about a larger um sort of violence that is a function of white supremacy and systemic oppression right um we're talking about a lot of really uh, belief systems and ideologies that are perpetuated against um, queer and trans people all the time, right? So there is nothing to forgive because nothing has been resolved, right? And the, the, the shooter was just sort of a manifestation of that um, rhetoric, of that ideology, and it was then projected as violence onto a vulnerable group of people, right? An innocent group of people. And so I don't think that there's anything to forgive is an open case as far as I'm concerned, okay. right? Like until we are able to stop killing queer people, right? It's, there's, there's nothing to resolve, right? I appreciate that. I yeah. appreciate that. Um, so we can move away from, from, from that part of it. Um, the post situation though has created multiple opportunities for people to do different things. Um, I know that there's a, the Post Foundation or One Post mm -hmm. or however they, um, the, the title for that is. I, I believe that the One Orlando Alliance or has kind of come out of this type of a situation as well, with people pulling together. Has, has the queer community been more responsive to one another or is there still perhaps issues that you know, I know that racism really plays a, 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 a big part in that community still. Um, but has that even been, maybe use your word, resolved or close to being resolved? No, because I think that even in the reporting of Pulse, one of the primary narratives that was always lost is that this was a crime against LGBTQ people of color, 
right? And I think that that part of the narrative was never really emphasized in the way that it should have been, right? Mm -hmm. And so when we're talking about um, sort of um, progressive politics and things like that, um, where the queer community is just a complex, multicultural, um, sort of multidimensional group. Um, and I think that if you're just going to look at this tragedy from one lens, then you're missing the narrative. Okay. Um, I think that there, there has been a, a, an effort, aside from the, some of the organizations you named, um, that I think are doing maybe a better job of addressing um, really kind of communal and cultural concerns. So like Q Latin X, for example, which was born out of this tragedy that was specifically there to help support the Latinx community um, that was deeply impacted. And they were doing it from a culturally responsive lens, which okay. I think is so important. And I think that that's what made that organization work and thrive and continue to be a pillar for the Latinx community, right? Uh, because those, um, the, the, the cultural elements of that were never dismissed or diminished or lost. Um, whereas I think that maybe some of the other organizations um, maybe were a little too single focused. Um, okay. They also, I, I can respect what they were doing in terms of economic retribution. I can respect that. But that's, as far as I'm concerned, that's where it ended, okay. right? Um, it ended with cutting checks. Right, but we still have queer people of color, um, survivors of the, the the violence that are still struggling medically um, from a mental health perspective um, that still need support. And it's kind of like, all right, well, after the cameras left, where where y'all at? What are we doing? You know. So <laughs> uh, and so that's why we're five years later still trying to make sure yeah. that the queer community has access to the resources that they need. Yeah, so there's two questions that came up for you. You made me think about this. So the governor just signed the other day this trans bill, um, stopping athletes. Thoughts? I can already tell. <laughs> that's how I feel. It's yeah. like, it's disgusting. It's, it, and it's like, that's where, that's where we're at. You know what I mean? If anybody wants to know where we're at, this is where we're at. We're at Governor DeSantis signing an anti-trans bill on the first day of Pride Month. That's where we're at, right? Yeah. And so, um, and and so, we're we're not. I think it's important that yes, we are acknowledging that these things are happening, right? So I think awareness is key, um, but I also think that action is what actually creates the change, right? And we still have the, the um, power structures that are working um, against us. So how do you get people to actually hear the message and not react and respond to nonsense? Because I don't know that people who are yelling and screaming about all these different things actually even know what they're talking about, right? So when people are talking about you know critical race theory or talking about you know what's happening in the transgender community they don't even have the full information it seems like and they're making these decisions based off of somebody else and telling them you know somebody else is pulling or co-opting the narrative um how do we get people to listen um well i think that we have to decide who gets to have a voice right and um more often than not even though i think that queer people of color are becoming more visible, I still think that the face of the LGBTQ movement is white and cisgender. That's just what it looks like, right? And so a lot of times white people are still leading the conversation or dictating the conversation around um, queer and trans rights, right? Um, and they're sort of, um, they're, they're dictating that narrative instead of us telling our own narratives. Right. Yeah. And so I do think that, um, but again, we have a racism issue within the LGBTQ community as well. Right. And so we have to um, sort of get in the underbelly of some of these um, issues so that we are able to be successful in creating space. Right. right? For, um, for all the different voices. Right. And I also think that there's still this disregard for queer people as righteous human beings 
that is getting in the way of um, progress, right? So we're not maybe taking heed to what queer folks are saying because we're still not seeing them as complete, whole, and dignified people, right? And so I think that that's sort of another element that we have to do is we still have to recognize um, people, recognize the humanity, recognize their narratives as valid. Right. And for some reason, we're still invalidating people's narratives, which is yeah. like, huh? <laughs> what do you mean? Like, we can't, I mean, everyone's narrative is, it has to be valid and it has to be taken seriously. Right. Mm -hmm. um, that is still substantial um, information. And I still think that the cis hetero white narrative is still the only narrative that we think is valid and everyone else's is just the alternative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's June 11th and we're midway through the month. And um, how should people be uh, celebrating Pride Month? You know, we, they, they've lost 10 days already now. So what can they do from this point forward and, and actually really do something to really celebrate queer folk? I'm gonna be honest with you. I have a really complicated relationship with June ever since the Pulse Massacre. Oh, okay. Right? okay. Um, because in one vein, yes, it's Pride Month, right? And so we want to celebrate and share and be visible and do all those things. But because the Pulse Massacre happened in June, right? Mm. Which is almost like adding insult to injury right. in some ways. It um, it's very complicated. Right, so I want to be, um, you know, yeah, let's be excited, things like that. Um, but it's also a time of mourning um, for um, for a lot of us, particularly in Orlando, right? I don't know if um, I've lived in Orlando since the um, since the tragedy, so I'm not really sure what other queer folks are experiencing outside of this area. But I know for us, there's a tender kind of spot there um, for 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 June. So whenever June hits. Yes, I'm thinking, oh, it's Pride Month. And then I'm also thinking June 12th is, is right around the corner, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think that, um, I, I think that to honor Pride Month is for us to honor the, the, those, those that have been taken from us, right? So I do think that there needs to be um, space for us to continue to memorialize um, the, 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 the the, the victims of violence um, and understand that that is part of the narrative, yeah. right? To understand that there is pain um, in this process, right? Yeah. Um, and so I do think that adequate um, time and space should happen. So um, tomorrow there will be, um, you know, visuals and events and things like that where you can go and, and pay your respects to those that have been taken to from us because that gives us perspective about where we need to continue going right um but on we, the other we, side we, we, the whole thing is we can't forget right we, you can't uh, we can't just kind of like roll over it as a, as a, it never happened exactly exactly so part of pride month and part of the advocacy around pride should be to talk about and tell the whole story right is that um we have um as much as we are resilient, there is still um, a lot that we have overcome and we can't forget any of those things. Um, yeah. The other thing that I think um, in terms of to be mindful of in Pride Month is not to get sucked into what I call rainbow capitalism. So there are <laughs> a lot of businesses this month that want to make themselves feel current and rele relevant in the know and they'll throw all their rainbow painted products at you. Um, and it's important to recognize that that is just a marketing strategy. That is just the appropriation of queer culture to help you buy more things. It's, it's as performative as all the businesses that wanted to say Black Lives Matter last summer, right? It's just, it's the same thing. So with it, it, the rainbow, the, 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 the perpetuation or the peddling of the, of the rainbow by corporations, um, again, those companies don't care about the welfare of queer people. Wow. It's they just don't. Mind, right? so, I, I showed it I care, but I'm, I'm also making bank off of this. Exactly. Well. Period. Right. So 
and until um, queer people have access to safety, right, to healthcare, to housing, to um, to to just to just general community and access to safe spaces, mm-hmm. then I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not buying what you're selling. I'm not buying what you're selling. So then I think that the response to that is to get connected to those groups. If you're going to um, use your money and your funds to put towards something, then there are many organizations that are actually doing the work. There are boots on the ground. They are really supporting the health and wellness of queer people in a way that makes sense, in a way that is sustainable. Yes. Right. And so yeah. that is really um, if you want to put your dollars somewhere, that's it. And then lastly, everybody should be dancing all the time. Right. So I do think that we should still be able to celebrate and to be visible as visible as we can be. Right. Um, and, 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 and do that and just be just be grateful to, to be here and to be in community, um, celebrate kind of having your tribe if, if you have found that. Yeah. Um, I think that that's, that's also really, really critical to still celebrate life. What's so it has to be sort of that balance. What's your go-to dance song? Oh, my go-to dance song? Yeah. I really like anything yeah. like James Brown. Like some <laughs> like good like funk, you know? Like yeah. that's just, I mean, it's just that bass line don't let up. And you just have to just, you know, you just keep you just feel it in your soul. Yes, it just in the whole body. It's just it's a whole body experience, and I think yeah. any song that gives you a whole body experience. Okay, like, all right. So, okay. That's, all right. So that's that's kind of interesting. I want to see you do your moves. <laughs> so, um, so we have we talked about you know some things in this in this so far this hour, and um, and the gist of it is that tomorrow is really going to be probably a, a maybe a Debbie Downer type of a day for people um, because people are going to be like, yeah, we should remember, but it also takes me back. Yeah. So yeah. what's your what's your hope for the future? How do what how do we how do we tackle this? How do we get past the 12th? So I think that my my main concern or um or my main interest is in building community, right? Um, I think that um, there are a lot of uh, queer folks who um, do not have the support of their like biological family. And so they often find non-biological kinship um, through building um, chosen or found families, right? Um, And I think that that's so important, right? Because we all want to feel seen, heard and understood. Um, and being around people that share experiences that are similar to us um, really makes us feel, um, you know, validated and that we have a place, right? So it reduces that feeling of isolation. Yeah. Um, and so I think that any way that we can help contribute, whether we are those spaces, we are creating those spaces, or whether we know how to lead other people to those spaces, um, I think is really essential, right? I think that once we sort of are able to build up those tribes that really edify us and, and, and help us kind of live our best life, so to speak, um, that is rebellion, right? That, that is us showing up as our full self, shining bright like a diamond um, and, and, and being in spaces that make space for us um, mm-hmm. is really what keeps us alive, right? Yeah. I think that... Um, denigration, isolation, rejection, um, and, and, and violence, those are the things that are degenerative, right? Yeah. And right. so my hope is that we can find generative spaces and opportunities mm-hmm. so that queer people know that their existence is worthy and necessary and, and needed. Um, that's, that's, you know, it's that recognition piece, right? And I think that we can do that through relationships. Excellent, excellent, excellent. So we got another special day that comes up in June. Mm-hmm. June Teeth. Yes. You know, and, you know, and again, almost going back and, and being somewhat melancholy about it and knowing the reason why Juneteenth is even a, a thing in the right. first place. But, you know, coming up, um, people celebrate. You know, I remember growing up and people getting dressed up and going out to parties and celebrating Juneteenth. I'm like, what is Juneteenth? I was like, 
Why are they spelling it that way? What's going on? What's the wrong? This doesn't seem right. And then understanding once I learned what it was, the significance behind what this day is. Um, any thoughts about Juneteenth? Oh yeah, like Juneteenth is our day, 100%. Um, I, I, I went to a, an HBCU, an historically black college or university for my undergrad experience. I went to FAMU, had to put that um, on the record. And so we, um, I was definitely steeped in a lot of um, sort of um, African-American history, the history of black and African descendants and things like that. And so Juneteenth became part of my learning experience and sort of understanding, like you said, the history of why this is even a thing, but then also the permission to really revel in that and to really celebrate that um, and not think of it as just some kind of like secondary um, kind of nuance, um, but it is something that we should uh, pay attention to. Mm -hmm. I feel that last year, um, because we were really in the thick of processing um, George Floyd, I yep. noticed a lot more energy behind Juneteenth last okay. year than I'd ever mm -hmm. seen on like social media. And I'm like, yeah, y'all never did this before. Right, yeah, right. Because in the past, I think going to an HBCU, you feel like a lot that you know is like underground information. So I always <laughs> felt that like Juneteenth was like underground information. It was like a secret holiday. It was like a little secret holiday. Yeah, yeah. And it was only for like the Pan African folks. You know what I'm saying? Like it was like they were the only ones doing Juneteenth. But I do feel like there has been um, sort of a, a surge, just along with a lot of the other sort of race-based conversations that are having, as, that we're having right now or have been for the last year. I saw that same energy with Juneteenth. I was like, oh, oh, okay. So y'all, okay, y'all, y'all trying to be yeah, more. I did. I did. Yes. And so, and I want that same energy to continue, yeah. right? I don't think mm -hmm. that Black history should be a secret. Right? <laughs> so, Especially given what we just found out if you paid any attention on June 1st to what happened in Tulsa. Exactly, exactly. So that's what Juneteenth is really all about. All of this, all of this is yes. the mix in terms yes. of yes. understanding your history. Exactly, and we have to keep the memories alive, right? Um, especially because there are power structures that are trying to write different stories. Yeah. And so it is up to us to tell our own stories and to keep those stories alive and well. And I think that celebrating Juneteenth in all of our flair and all of our goodness and all of our seasoning, that, that, that is necessary. So Amber, Dr. Norman, why do I like you so much? <laughs> I don't know, I keep it all the way real. <laughs> How did you come into my life, child? What's going on? What's going on here? You're my mentor. <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm laughing. I'm, I'm going to change the subject a little bit. I want to just really talk about you a little bit. Um, we talked about things, um, but it's really about people. And um, I had an opportunity to travel with you uh, yes. to South Africa. Yes. I came across a picture the other day. Um, and in the picture, the under caption, you said something to the effect of, we were looking for fruit. We were looking for a fruit stand. Were we really looking for a fruit stand? Yes, you ended up buying out the fruit stand and we fed the whole um, little township with it. Okay. I, 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 I had to kind of look back. I was looking, I remember looking at the picture and looking at how- Yeah, I think that we, we were, um, we had just visited like a neighborhood or kind of a, a little town and, um, and I think that there was like a small quantity of something. And I think we were looking to see like where the source was. And I think you were asking like, where, like, where did that person get that fruit or something like that? And I think somebody else wanted some of what they had. And I think that it was like, well, no, you can have your own fruit. We just got to find out where it was. And so yeah. we're sort of wandering around and then we got to the, so the little girl who was bring us where it was. Okay. Yeah. And then, and then we ended up um, distributing you know, yeah. um, it's as much of that, of, as much food as we could into that, that yeah. state. So I remember you, um, I remember you, um, we were at Table Mountain and I got this glimpse of you. Uh, we climbed up the mountain, we were doing our little trail walk and stuff like that. And I don't know what made you do it, but you, you brought with you, a, 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 I guess a little tablet or your journal. journal? Yeah, like yeah. And you were sitting there 
And I remember sneaking a picture of you um, sitting there um, because it was like peaceful. Nobody was, you know, you kind of separated from everybody who was with us and you kind of went and did your own thing. And I was watching you and I was like, wow, she really is into this because one of the things that you used to always do was talk about how um, spiritual you were or how you just kind of, you know, go into these writing things and you just write your thoughts and poetry and all this other stuff. And I was like, wow, she's really doing it. She's actually for real out there doing what she says that she does in nature and enjoying the, that. So can you kind of recount what that experience is like for you? Um, do you remember that yeah, time? Yeah, I, I remember because I, I stepped over a, a, a barrier to get to that area, which is probably something in retrospect you probably shouldn't do on a mountain. But, um, <laughs> but I did feel, I, I knew I wanted to, um, I was very overwhelmed by the view that we had when we reached the top of Table Mountain. And I wanted to sit in that, right? I didn't want it to, I, I didn't want the moment to pass me by too quickly. Mm -hmm. And so I knew I just wanted to sit and commune um, in that, um, from that vantage point, from that perspective. And I do not remember um, exactly what I was writing. I mean, I'd have to access it. I was gonna ask you, I was gonna say, do you remember what you wrote? I don't remember what I wrote. Um, but I know that I was grateful. I do remember that. I, I remember um, just feeling so full and so grateful in that moment um, for, for arriving to that moment, right? So I have, um, um, you know, I, I, I think I, you just kind of reflect on your testimony sometimes and you, and you really just uh, um, sort of recognize how far you've come and there are those very sort of still moments where you need to um, sort of just revel um, in that feeling. Um, but I, I still do this. I mean, I'm always, my, my um, journal is always in my knapsack or in my bag and I'm always writing everywhere. Even when I went and retreated to the forest after Pulse, I wrote and I wrote and I wrote every single morning, sometimes multiple times a day, just sort of reflecting or narrating um, my experience. Um, I think that when I'm in those spaces, um, like natural spaces, mm -hmm. I think I feel um, that it's easier um, for me to sort of connect with my inner experience. Mm -hmm. um, and then I transfer that into sort of written, written word. So um, yeah, definitely that experience is very much reflective of just how, um, how I meet spirit. Yeah. So do you often go back and read it or do you write for some type of uh, release? Yeah, sometimes it's more of an outlet. Um, and then sometimes um, I do I do go back and, and, and read things. It's really a sort of a way to see or measure growth as well. Like if I okay. read something I wrote maybe a year and a half ago and you're just like, oh, wow, or um, I don't feel that same way anymore or I feel yeah, like, like maybe you, maybe you don't or maybe or maybe you need a reminder right, um, about something. Okay. Um, and, and, or sometimes you just want to laugh about an experience that, mm -hmm. that, that you had. Yeah. Um, so it, it's, it's, I think it's good to sort of go back, but it is a, a way for me to process. So it, this is just a, a, a crazy question. Do you, do you actually, um, do you like critique yourself and what you wrote? Do you like look at this and say, oh, this wasn't grammatically correct or will you just read it for the fun of it? Um, no, I, I'm actually, when it comes to creative writing um, or just writing for therapeutic reasons, um, I'm surprisingly a lot less critical um, of myself. I, I think it's important that I don't, I don't criticize my feelings a lot, right? And so a lot of my writing is very emotive. Um, and so I have to believe if I'm committed to being honest in the writing, then I trust that. I trust that what came out of me is the truth of, of the matter. Um, and I just accept it as, as that, but also I'm not submitting my creative writing for publication. So I don't have an inner critic. <laughs> so I just write for me and my journal is my journal and I leave it at that. <laughs> That's pretty cool. So, um, you wrote in your journal when last? Um, maybe two days ago. Uh -huh. And, um, I don't want to know the information in there, but what drew you to writing that day? Um, I'm, um, 
I, I think that I am, there's some challenges going on with uh, my family, right? So for example, like my dad is having some health challenges. And so I've been leaning a lot on writing as a way to sort of process okay. um, some of my feelings around this particular kind of life change okay. that he's going through. And so again, it kind of, it, it, it's, it's very therapeutic in that way. Like if I know I need to put, get something out of me or process it a little bit more, um, or just have a place to rest. So maybe anxiety isn't living in my body. I have a place to put it. Yeah. Um, it just becomes a very necessary tool for me. Right, right, right. So you, you've completed your dissertation a year ago. Mm. Was it, a year? it was a year, right? Was it been a year? Yes, it's been, it was a year. And the journey to the dissertation was in and of itself a journey. Oh, certainly. Uh, and you know, having to deal with all that. Now, can you, in retrospect, looking back, is there anything that comes up for you um, now that you have, like, put that paper down and you know is published and and your doctor Norman? Is there anything a year later that is um, you know something that you're hanging your hat on um, with this whole process? So I, I do want to mention that writing a dissertation in the middle of a pandemic, <laughs> at the height of the pandemic, was, I think, a challenge in and of itself, right? And so there was that sort of piece that you had to navigate because you already had all these feelings that were going on in terms of what's happening with the pandemic, what does this even mean? And I think I went through a small existential crisis um, during the writing of the dissertation, um, but so that was a bit of a, a struggle in terms of, you know, just staying motivated and trying to kind of focus. Um, and I had to sort of, and there was a lot going on last summer too, right? Just the, the noise of the world just made it a little bit difficult. Um, I think in retrospect, um, I look at it like I went through a really hard thing. Like getting a PhD is just hard, right? It's just, I mean, there's no way around that. Yeah. Um, and and I think that there is sort of a pride around like, I did a really hard thing, right? Um, and it definitely pushed me and I learned so much about myself and I'm a better teacher because of it. I'm a better scholar because of it. I can articulate my ideas um, critically. I can, you know, I've, I've, I've established more relationships. You've always been able to do that. You've always been able to do that. Well, I, you know, I mean, you know, even just like taking what I already had and just continue to push and to grow outside of my own maybe yeah. comfort level and things right. like that. So it really was like, it was like an experience. Like I felt like I was in like this like really large simulation where I just like learned all of these things and I sort of came out. Um, and now I'm just kind of trying to figure out who I am. Right. I think that I'm, I'm really just um, I have a new identity. I'm, I'm outside of the student, the, the formal student identity. I'm always a student. Yeah. But I think that you sort of um, hung that part up. And yeah. now I am really just trying to find my own voice. You know, what's really funny about that whole situation is that I remember probably around 2012 saying, you need to get your doctorate. You got to go get some work. You're going to go get some work experience. You're gonna, you were like, uh, nah. Yeah. And then I think a year later, I'm like, hey. I know. I tell people that all the time. When they ask me, like, what made me go get my doctorate? I was like, I didn't decide to get my doctorate. I said, Dr. Butler was bothering me. And he encouraged me to go get I saw I tell people I was minding my own business. You were minding your own Dr. business. Dr. Butler knocked on my door and was like, hey, you should think about um, getting a doctorate. And and I appreciate that because it turned out to be one of the better decisions that I've that I've made. I think that I am who I am as an educator um, and even as a clinician because I decided to take that additional journey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just remember I kept saying you kept pulling me off and you kept saying, no, I'm not. I'm not I'm minding my own business. <laughs> I, got my own, I got my own practice here. I'm doing good. I'm doing all right. Hey. And then I remember I got the call and it was like, I, I think I'm ready. Yeah. Yeah. Here we are. <laughs> here we are. And here we are. Yeah. So um, any last minute thoughts, anything coming up for you that you would like to talk about, um, give to the viewing public? What's, what's, what's on the new horizon for you? 
maybe you want to share that. Is there anything that you're going to share in that regards? You know, I, I don't No, there isn't. I, I'm not in terms of um, any new projects or, or anything like that. Um, I am because really I'm learning to relax again. Right. I'm learning to um, I'm learning boundaries. I'm learning all those other things that um, that when you go through the doc program, you, you have to have another sort of skill set, another kind of mechanism to really help you get through that process. That those are things that you don't necessarily need in other contexts. And so um, I'm learning to like not be on all the time. So I'm learning to sort of settle into myself, um, sort of feel out my body. And I'm just taking my time a bit, right? Um, I like that. I, I am starting a new position. Well, I can share this part. Um, I am. Um, starting a new faculty position at Prescott College out, out in Prescott, Arizona. And so it's a private teaching institution um, that really has a social justice and sustainability focus. And so I'm super excited about um, seeing what that opportunity has for me um, in terms of how my scholarship will continue to grow and expand um, in, in, that, in that area. So that's sort of kind of like where I'm at. I'm like, I'm just like, I'm brand new. Like, that's just how I feel. I'm just sort of experiencing myself as sort of a, a new person and sort of figuring out um, just like, you know, how I want to show up in the world. All right. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. And so um, I got something for you. Hold on a second. Okay. I can't hear it. Can you hear it? Oh, there it is. It's like cutting out a little bit, but I can hear it. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> That's the funk. That's the funk. That is the juice of life. Uh, it's cutting out a little too bad for me. That's all right. I don't have it on the, um, I should have went and played around with it and shared my screen or something, but I, I mean, I didn't want to kind of play around too much while yeah. we were talking. But uh, yeah, I just thought about that. So now I got a whole new love for for James Brown. I got to now think about it. When I want to start dancing, I got to get into yeah. my funky And group. even like his band, like not even, even if it's the tracks where it's like just the band and like none of him, yeah. I can like have that on repeat. It's just good instrumentation. It's just that, it's just that groove. You know, the, the, the part where he says, give me my cape or whatever. He's yes. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I'm done now. Give me my cape. Let me, yes. let me take off. <laughs> and that's what everybody should do for Juneteenth is they need to blast their best and greatest funkadelic freestyle, anything that embodies freedom and, and liberated movement and connection. That's right. what should be happening. Um, <laughs> All of for the rest of June, for in celebration of our people that have been lost, in celebration of the life that we're still living, just put on your best funk track. Yeah, I have to laugh at that because I, 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 I music is my thing. I mean, that's kind of the thing that kind of gives me release and things along those lines. And recently, um, you know, like even in my car, when I, I listen to, I rock to, I think I shared this with you, but um. From the soundtrack of The Greatest Showman, there's a song called This Is Me. You ever hear that? Remember that song, This Is Me? Mm -hmm. Oh, you gotta listen to it. And, okay. and, and it's, not a, it's not necessarily a dance song, but it's a really meaningful song because it talks about how you um, really come to accept who you are and people should see you for who you are. And it's just a very powerful song. Mm -hmm. And um, and so I always blast it really loud um, in the car and I'm rocking them. People probably think I'm crazy if they, if they see me, you know, driving down the street or whatever have you. But there's something about the song, especially when you play it really loud, that um, really puts um, some energy into the space, so to speak. Yes, yes. Um, so now I got that to think about. So now I got James Brown and, and everything else. I've always liked James Brown. So um, I, I, I sometimes didn't understand what he was saying all the time. But uh, but he definitely 
um, in terms of his music, he definitely knew what he was saying. So, um, so anyway, Amber, Dr. Norman, I really appreciate you spending time with me today, um, recounting some of your experiences, especially you know as it comes to this month, this this wonderful month of June, Pride Month, and um, and how we get in front of that narrative. I think you really kind of explained it a little bit. We get, in order for us to really get back to understanding what Pride Month is all about, we have to be able to heal from the things that have happened, especially in the Orlando community around the post incident. And, um, and I think you beautifully explained that um, today. And so I appreciate you as always dropping the knowledge. And um, now people can kind of see why I wanted you and hope that you wanted yourself. And I, it wasn't for me, it was for you to be able to get this doctorate and then go show the world um, what was necessary, yes. right? And so I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I mean, this has been a great um, cathartic conversation to have. Um, and so I, I appreciate you having me and then also just facilitating such a necessary discussion. Yes, most definitely. So thank you uh, for all you all who are here. Thank you for being a part of, um, of today. What I would say to you is um, on tomorrow, June 12th, do something, some, do something in remembrance of the lives that were lost, but also remember the people who are still here surviving and dealing with, and I shouldn't say surviving, I think we're thriving um, with what has gone on. You know, so reach out and touch some folks and know that there may be in a state, there may be something that's going on for them, but we can never forget. We can't forget. And we can move forward with the knowledge that we have, to, we have some changes that we need to do. We need to really bring and embrace and accept um, the queer community in ways that we haven't before. And we have to stop the nonsense the bills and the other things that are coming up that really block people in their process. And um, we should be about humanism and bringing people together. So thank you, Dr. Norman. Thank, uh, you. thank you all. And we'll see you on the next podcast. Peace, y'all. Peace, y'all.